Greetings and welcome to Biology. In this first lesson, we are going to discuss the basis for life and the different properties which are required to have life. You'll notice on this page there are objectives. Objectives are learning outcomes. This is my expectation of what you will take away from this lesson. We will revisit these at the end of each video to ensure that you have learned what you need to continue the other portions of the lesson. Our objectives for today are to be able to differentiate between living and non-living things and to be able to analyze the different properties of life. We will perform some exercises related to this later on in the lesson. Before we begin, it is important to know what you will be studying in this course. The term biology can be simply broken down into its parts, which clearly explains a majority of your coursework. Bio means life and ology means the study of. If we combine the two, it is evident that biology is simply the study of life. This encompasses many different subjects, however, we will only concentrate on a specific few in this course. Even before we get into the details, it is important to determine what objects in our world have life. Now, this may seem relatively simple, like determining whether a male bird or a male box is alive but we really need to think about the individual properties that make up life and there are eight that we are going to discuss now here I want you to think about the properties that you looked at the properties that we had assigned you to write down what are some things that you thought life had to have in order to be considered life well, we're gonna look at the eight specific ones now and they are that life must be made of cells it must display organization it must grow and develop it must reproduce, require energy, maintain homeostasis, response to stimuli, and that the adaptions evolve over time. Now we're going to discuss each one of these in a little more detail. So first, let's look and understand that every organism, from bacteria to elephants, must be made of cells. Cells are the basic structure of all living things, very similar to how the basic structure of matter is the atom. Some organisms like bacteria are only made of one cell. These are called unicellular organisms. All of the functions of that one cell allow it to survive. Other organisms are multicellular. That is, they contain more than one cell. The picture on the lower right is of a plant, and notice that the cells, which look like bricks, are interconnected with each other, creating a multicellular organism. We will explore more about these cells later on. Next, we will look and see how organisms must display some form of organization. Think about a house. How is a house typically arranged? Well, there are different rooms for different purposes. You know, the kitchen is used to make food, and the bedrooms are used for sleeping, and life is no different than this. Life is organized on several different levels. Atoms form molecules, which form parts of cells. These parts of cells form a very specific task such as providing energy or storing genetic code. These form cells, and in multicellular organisms, cells form tissues, tissues form organs, and those organs have a specific role, such as the heart for pumping blood or the stomach for digestion. All life has some form of organization from small to large. Third, we must look at how life can grow and develop. If the term seems a little vague, well, you'd be correct. Growth and development can differ depending on the type of organism. All organisms have the ability of growth, which, for multicellular organisms, means the creating of new cells to build a larger organism. Humans grow from very small, almost microscopic embryos into larger multicellular organisms. Additionally, unicellular organisms can grow as well, only this occurs at the cellular level, with the cell simply becoming larger. Organisms develop as well by going through natural changes in an organism, such as growing hair, aging, or reaching sexual maturity. Next, an organism must be able to produce offspring through the process of reproduction. Reproduction is the ability to produce another organism. Two types of reproduction dominate the earth. 
Asexual reproduction is one where an organism produces a copy of itself. Bacteria perform asexual reproduction as they make identical copies of themselves. Sexual reproduction occurs in most plant and animal species and requires two individuals to produce an offspring, one male and one female. There are benefits and drawbacks to each type of reproduction. Asexual reproduction can be very quick, making thousands of copies of an organism within hours. However, because there is no change in DNA, each organism is identical to its parent. This can be problematic for an organism's survival, and we'll discuss more of this later on in the DNA unit. Sexual reproduction provides the exchange of DNA, which allows for offspring which are different genetically. However, because it takes two individuals to produce an offspring, these organisms do not reproduce nearly as quickly. Different types of reproduction offer advantages and disadvantages. Two organisms that can reproduce sexually and produce a normal offspring are part of what's called a species. A species can only reproduce within the same species, however, there are a few exceptions to the rule, such as a liger, which is a tiger-lion combination, a mule, which is a cross between a donkey and a horse, and even brown and polar bear crosses. Next, obtaining energy is important for an organism as well. Without energy, an organism cannot perform any function required for life. In the ecology unit, we will study the many ways which organisms can obtain energy. Humans, for example, must take in food from other organisms by the process of eating. Plants, however, can obtain energy from the sun through the process of photosynthesis. Some bacteria are even able to use the energy stored in chemical bonds to obtain that energy. Regardless of how the task is performed, all life must obtain energy. Sixth, organisms must maintain homeostasis, which is just a big fancy term that refers to an organism's ability to maintain a stable internal environment. Now this includes things like temperature, where it is important for it to remain constant. So how does the body do this? Well, it maintains homeostasis through the release of chemicals called hormones, or by certain bodily functions like sweating. This can then release heat from the body, allowing it to cool during or after, say, strenuous exercise. The ability to maintain the stable internal environment is essential for life survival. Next, an organism must be able to respond to stimuli to be considered living. Think about someone dropping a piece of glassware in a silent classroom, or... <laughs> Did you jump? Well, that's a response from a stimulus, me banging on my desk. All students react to a stimulus in some way, shape, or form, whether it be, let's say, looking at the glassware dropping or jumping. Plants can react to sunlight by growing towards it, or our heart rate increases due to a scary or dangerous situation. These, all of these bodily responses are to an outside stimulus. So responding to stimuli is important for an organism's survival. Finally, an organism must be able to have its adaptions change over time. The term biologists use for this is evolution. We'll discuss more of this in a later unit. However, organisms must change over time to be considered living. A good example is the giraffe. One adaption it has is a long neck to be able to reach food in order to survive. Over a long period of time, the giraffe's necks became longer because they were more likely to reach food. long neck giraffes had a better adaptation to survive. It means that ones with small necks did not survive. Giraffes with long necks will then typically have offspring with long necks, so the genetics of the giraffes change over time. Now, we'll discuss this more in detail in a later unit, but changes in ad adaptations or adaptions is known as evolution and is important for an organism's survival. Now, all of these properties of life are unique. However, it is very important to understand that all eight of these properties must be present to be considered living. If just one is missing, the object is non-living. It is your goal to be able to identify what properties of life exist in certain objects to determine if they are living or non-living. It's not just important to say that an object is living or non-living, but to understand why it is living or non-living. So now that we've looked at the eight properties of life and discussed them thoroughly, let's look at it, let's now that we've looked at the eight properties of life, let's look at an example so that we can see if we can determine which properties of life a certain thing has. And that certain thing is fire. 
What I want you to do is to pause the video as soon as I have finished talking and write down what properties fire has that would make it living and then what properties it does not have. Go ahead and pause the video and take about a minute to finish this. I'll wait. Welcome back. Let's take a look at some of the properties that fire has that would make it living. Well, a fire can grow and develop, right? You can see house fires that start as small kitchen fires and grow and develop relatively quickly. A fire can reproduce, that is, it can make a copy of itself and continue growing and developing and making more and more fire. Fire clearly requires energy. It needs a source of energy, oxygen, and something that allows it to burn in order to survive. And it must maintain a stable environment as well. That is, it needs to be hot and maintain that oxygen and whatever it is burning to allow it to burn. But let's look at some properties that it does not have. We know that fire is not made of cells. Fire does not have those individual components that allow it to make life. Fire doesn't necessarily respond to a stimulus. If you dump water on it, it's not going to try to evade it or do something about it. Fire cannot change over a period of time. Fire is fire. Fire doesn't you know, change or adapt to whatever environment it's placed in, and nor does it display any type of biological organization. It is going to be important for you to be able to do this and to be able to analyze certain characteristics of an organism or thing and determine whether it is living or non-living. Additionally, there are a few instances in which life can occur without having some of these properties. For example, a mule. We talked a little bit about this earlier. It is an organism that has a donkey for a dad and a horse for a mom. But because it is a hybrid, it's the term we use to describe these types of organisms, of two different species, it cannot reproduce. However, that certainly doesn't mean it's not living. Can you think of any more exceptions to the rules like this? Maybe that'll be an assignment later on, so be sure you're thinking about that. So, in revisiting the objectives, hopefully you're able to differentiate between living and non-living things now and analyze different properties of life. We'll see you next time. Thanks.